Oh, hello, dear. So, this is the end of the year, and we are moving into 2020. I'm here to tell you why you should add Java to one of your goals for 2020. Some people just hate Java, and I understand. I will give you some reasons why I suspect people end up hating Java. Think of a Mercedes Benz. What will come to your mind? Surely you wouldn't think of an old Mercedes Benz of mm, the 90s. You would think of a modern Mercedes Benz, right? Now, then why is it that when people talk about Java, they always refer to the old Java? Java has a lot of versions. Was Java ever verbose and um, complex? Yes, it was. So we are other languages such as PHP. Another thing you should know is that JavaScript, which is thought of being a new age programming language, was created around the same time as Java. Let's touch some issues that are common. So the first issue, Java is verbose. You have to write a lot to do a little. Okay. The most common example people give are Pojo classes. Now, these are normal plain old Java object classes where you have your variables and methods. I have never really had issue with those kind of classes because our IDEs are so good today, like IntelliJ. It's so good, I generate all this very easily. Okay, let's say you don't even want to generate it. You want smaller code. There's a library called Loombook, which changes your maybe 17 lines class into three lines. If you wish to really reduce those lines. Java has var. Before, if you wanted to create a variable, you have to write the type of the variable and then in the right hand, you still have to declare the type of the variable when you're creating the object. With var, you don't need to write all that boilerplate code. Java 8 also brought in streams. If I have a video on streams as well, you can check that out. There's also a feature we might expect in Java, probably in the future. It's called records. It's not actually necessary. What we need is a way to say that this class is just a transparent container for some data. Records do just that. They replace all that Pojo code with just one line, because sometimes data is just data. You can customize records. You can override the hash code method, if you like. You can define additional methods. Here's a norm method for our point. You can customize the constructors to check invariants as, as points are constructed. What you can't do is add instance fields because instance fields would break the very different definition of a record, which is that its data content is transparent. It's just a dumb container for data. So that's a no-go. If you need to add a field, then you just need to write your own class. OK, so that's records. Some people also say Java is slow to write. Hmm, slow to write. I think it depends. Java is still improving and becoming more concise. So we have a new kid in the block, Kotlin. Kotlin isn't so new, and the project started around 2011. I also work on Android, so I can tell you what goes on there. Now, the latest Java around, it's like at this point of this recording, is Java 13. Now, the Java on Android is Java 7. Now, there's some Java 8 features you can use on Android, like um, like Lambda Expressions. Lambda Expressions came in Java 8. So you can use that in Java 7. You can use that on Android. So when Kotlin came, it was like a breath of fresh air. Not to Java, but to Android. So most times when people compare, when Android developers compare Java and Android, they are basically comparing Kotlin. When Android developers compare Kotlin and Java, unconsciously or consciously, I can't see, they are actually comparing Kotlin with Java 7. A 2019 Ferrari with a 
2001 Mercedes Benz is containing a great language. It's awesome. I think that's another language Java developers should check out. Gradually, Android is adding more Java features to Java used on Android. So you can expect more features on Android. But for other things Java, desktop, web, you have access to all the latest Java features. Another argument people make is Java is hard. Hmm. This is what I have observed. A lot of people who learned Java early in life learned it from school. Maybe schoolwork, university. Now, a student isn't able to understand what the lecturer is teaching. Most often, it's Java because they teach Java in these schools and a student ends up hating it. Now, the student goes through self-studying to learn JavaScript. When you learn something by yourself at your own pace, you tend to understand it and then you declare what you didn't understand hard. That's one of the factors and this is a very important factor I have observed. Also, I am soon going to create a Java course because I want to make it easy for you to understand Java. And I think once you understand Java, you can pretty much move to any language you want. Another thing spoken about is Java is heavy, it's slow, complex to start a project. Now, if you know about Spring Boot, I can basically start or create a web application like the project in under a few minutes. The dependencies I need and then it's ready to move on. Of course, maybe before you had to do a lot of configurations and all whatnot. Now, there are some frameworks which you can use if you want some lightweight web applications or REST APIs. There's Spark framework and then there's Javalin. Both of these you can use either Java or Kotlin. Some people might think that Java isn't for um, young people or startups. Now, firstly, I'm a young person, so, and I say, I love Java. Secondly, I've seen startups that use Java. It's not every startup that wants to use Node.js. Java is paid. There was a time everybody was in Java. JDK is paid. Java is paid. Oh no, Oracle. Oracle wants to kill Java. No, Java is free. Java is still free. As George mentioned, to establish a level playing field, Oracle has open sourced all of the significant commercial features that were previously available only to paying customers, These including application class data sharing, Java Flight Recorder, Java Mission Control, and the Zed Garbage Collector. Oracle builds and OpenJDK builds at this point are functionally interchangeable. This means that you can switch from one to the other as you please. It also means that all of this code is available under the GPL for anyone to build, test, publish, update, and support. So going forward, you'll continue to be able to get Java implementations in most any Linux distribution, whether derived from Red Hat, Debian, Gentoo, or even Arch. You'll also be able to get it from other providers. So now let me stop talking about the issues people claim Java has. Let us talk about the nice things. Firstly, if you learn Java, you will understand core programming concepts. There are books, blogs, articles, stack overflow answers. You can't really get lost in the Java ecosystem. It's one of the largest. Java is everywhere. You can use it for mobile. You can use it for web development. People even use it for artificial intelligence. I know the go-to language is Python for artificial intelligence, but you can use Java as well for embedded systems, for big data, for desktop applications, JavaFX. Have you heard of it before? Let's talk about what to expect in Java. What, what are we expecting? What's happening? You need to keep up with what's popping. Imagine you could create a website with only Java. Yes, I mean only Java. You don't use JavaScript, HTML, just Java. 
If you want to do that, you can use Vardin. So with Vardin, I've tested it out and it was really nice. And with Vardin, you can create modern looking websites, not some old fashioned websites, really polished looking websites, modern material design. So check them out. I'll put it in the link below. Another one is Quarkus. Now, did I pronounce it well? Quarkus. Hmm. So supersonic subatomic Java. This is the concept where we've taken Quarkus, a new open source project that was just born back in March. So literally this thing is really new, but it shows you how to take your Java enterprise style programming models and compile it down to native code. So in other words, you can actually have Java code that runs at the same speed as let's say C++ code. And this might not sound like all that interesting because we've actually known we could write Java code that runs the same as C++ code, but I mean actually it fit in the same memory footprint and the same disk footprint and then start incredibly fast. And we're going to talk about why that's important and when you see it here in this presentation. You don't only program in Java, you might program in Java, JavaScript, PHP, you know. Imagine you could have a project where you have Python, Python code and Java code, but they can work together. So I can run Python code in my Java code. So let's say I have a Python code with artificial intelligence code. You know, Python is good for that. But now that I have written it in Python, I don't need to convert it to Java. I just call it for my Java code and they can all work together. So to do that, you have GraalVM. This is a project by Oracle. So in order not to talk too much about it, this is not a GraalVM tutorial. I'll put a link to it below, but I will also have a little tutorial on GraalVM. I tested it out and the moment I was able to call JavaScript code from Java. I was like, wow. Now, if you know about Spring, you can use Spring to build microservices, but we have Micronauts. Increased demand for speed, developer productivity, simplicity, and robust cloud services integration leads to an increased demand for REST services and JVM-based microservices that respond quickly and don't rely on heavy runtime memory requirements. That's why the team that brought you Grails now introduces Micronaut, a polyglot framework for the rocket speed of today's developers. It's easy to implement, features quick instant startup, blazing fast throughput, requires a minimal memory footprint, and is simple to test and run. Micronaut is natively cloud native, open source, and always free. Ready to blast off? These are all interesting developments. Now there are different projects which are planning to bring features to Java. One of which is Project Loom. Now Project Loom will introduce fibers. Now fibers are like lightweight threads, but you can run a lot of them. It's actually kind of hard to see the fibers data because the threads data is so large in magnitude. Let's zoom in a bit, shall we? The fibers version of the, of the Jetty server starts out immediately responding to things uh, in under 150 milliseconds, and it quickly as, as, the, as things get optimized, sticks right around 100 milliseconds for the entire rest of the time. Well, the thread server, you know, it just kept spiking and spiking and running into thread loads and thrashing the processor, thrashing the operating system. So they're a bit flaky, but they're really fast, even right now. If you're part of the Java ecosystem, consider subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification bell and liking this video. I put out Java content, but not just Java content, things that surround the Java programmer's life, you know? 
I might touch other JVM languages like Scala, Kotlin, you know. So, see you later.